Well, in this module, we're going to focus on all the various invertebrates that you can find in your soil and that contribute significantly to soil health on working lands. And as you already heard from Stephanie, um, soil is full of this vast diversity of life. And what's really amazing to me, at least, is that nearly 25% of all the organisms that are on the planet today are soil animals. So it's it really is this amazing diversity that can be found under feet at all times. And the soil life can be microscopic with the smallest animals living in soil pores or in water films. Um, and then of course it's much larger with those animals that we can see with the naked eye and that create their own burrows or spaces that they excavate for themselves in the soil. This is a nice illustration that can help us visualize the abundance of soil life. And this is representative of the abundance within just a square meter of soil. So the, the organisms that are the most abundant are found on the platform, the very bottom. Those are the bacteria and fungi that Stephanie just talked about. And they're the smallest, um, they form the base. And then moving up in size, as soil creatures increase in size, there are fewer and fewer and fewer found within that square meter. Um, the size doesn't denote the value though, because soil life food webs really depend on creatures big and small and um, they depend on, on one another. So you can't have the smallest groups without some of these largest groups as well. So soil animals can play multiple important roles in soil. And we're gonna start with the decomposers. These are animals that break down plant and animal matter into material that are much more easily used by bacteria and fungi. And of course, bacteria and fungi are really superstar decomposers, um, but if animals can break down matter, it really helps bacteria and fungi be more effective. So the smaller the particles, the more niches or pores there are for bacteria to occupy, for example. And after plant material passes through the gut of um, a decomposing fly, for example, it has significantly more bacteria that can occupy that plant material than before it passed through the gut. So decomposition is a really critical role. Soil animals also help to enrich soil as they are burrowing and mixing soil, they are moving nutrients and minerals between the soil layer, and this helps significantly to influence soil fertility. It also um, influences soil structure, and uh, there are those burrowing animals, through that action, they help to bring subsoil to the surface and create more pores that bring air and water down to lower soil layers. And that's also beneficial for plants. Um, most plant roots like to travel through the areas of least resistance. So um, that burrowing and tunneling that animals do can be helpful in, in multiple ways. And then um, there are additional important um, ecological roles for soil animals. They fill a lot of different roles within food webs. They can be herbivores feeding on live plant matter. Um, they can be fungivores or bacteria vores influencing the microbial community. There can be predators of other animals or parasites of other animals. And then there are also a few groups that are important above ground um, as pollinators. So there's lots and lots of life that's happening underground and a lot of it happens out of our sight. So that's why we're spending time today to focus on a number of these different groups really shine a light on the roles that they play in soil health and we're, we're really focusing on just those groups that are most important in agricultural systems today. Um, we're gonna start with the smallest organisms and move up in size. Um, these are the protozoans. This is a group that used to be considered animals because they're mobile. They don't create their own food. They search out and hunt for food, um, but now they're in a kingdom of their own as scientists decide where they, where they fit in. Um, soil protozoans are single celled and they live in water films and they primarily feed on bacteria, but also some fungi and algae. 
And the way that they move is how they're grouped. So amoeba, which um, maybe we're all a little bit more familiar with, there, there's lots of cytoplasm and they look like little blobs, essentially. They move by just extending their, their cytoplasm, their blob a little bit further and pulling themselves across the surface. Um, testate amoeba move in a similar way, but they have a, a test, a, sort of like an outer shell, and they just stick an extension of their cytoplasm out of the shell to move them. Um, ciliate protozoans, as you might expect, use cilia to move, which are just finger, hair-like finger projections that they can whirl around. Um, and then the flagella protozoa have one single organ that's hair-like that they use like a whip to help propel. Um, protozoans exist within the upper soil, but some also can go as uh, um, pretty deep, as deep as 200 meters. And they're very sensitive to changes um, in soil and soil health. So that's the only group that aren't animals that we're talking about today. From here on out, we're focusing on animals and um, invertebrates because 99% of all soil animals are animals without backbones. And um, so we'll, we'll walk through some of these other groups. And again, we're starting with the smaller critters. Um, these are rotifers. They also live in water films and are microscopic. Um, you can recognize them if you've ever uh, put a little bit of soil in a petri dish with a little bit of water and, and looked under the microscope there. They're usually there. They're pretty ubiquitous. But you can recognize them um, by their crowns of cilia, which are these hair-like extensions, and they whirl them around to create a vortex to draw in their food. And um, they feed on bacteria and protozoa anything smaller than they are. <laughs> um, and because rotifers exist in this water film, they're very uh, sensitive to moisture levels. So in order to survive when water dries up in the soil, they form cysts, which is this resting animation stage. And they can survive that way for long periods of time. And the stasis period, the longest that we knew of previously to just about a month ago was 10 years, which seems like a very long time. Um, but in comparison, scientists actually recently revitalized rotifers from permafrost that was 24,000 years old. Um, these rotifers went on to reproduce. So um, there's obviously a lot we have to learn about their ability to survive in that stasis condition. Um, one last thing about rotifers is that they do reproduce asexually. So there aren't any males present that we know of. Um, it's just female rotifers out there and reproducing by laying unfertilized eggs. Here's a short video of these rotifers feeding. You can see the whorls of the cilia up here, and then they're attached by their little foot down here. Our next group up are um, tardigrades. This is a group that also lives in water films and are microscopic. And they're best known as, their common name is, is water bears. And they do really superficially resemble um, bears with their stubby legs and their long claws. And they actually have sort of a lumbering movement as well. Um, tardigrades have piercing mouth parts and they will feed on rotifers. Uh, nematodes, fungi, algae, bacteria, protozoans. And um, just like rotifers, they have to be able to enter this phase of suspended animation known as cryptobiosis uh, when the water in the soil dries up. And um, during this period, their metabolism slows way down and they can be very long lived, um, 30 years or more in this cryptobiotic state, um, and probably quite a bit more given what we know about rotifers. But uh, another unusual thing about tardigrades is they are incredibly resistant to radiation as well as extreme temperatures, both extreme cold and extreme um, heat, up to 150 degrees Celsius, for example. Plus they can survive in space without oxygen for 10 days. 
So <laughs> this is another group that is beyond the role that they play in soil. Scientists are interested in because they're so hardy and tolerant. There's just a lot of questions about how they're how they're able to survive under those extreme conditions. All right, next up are nematodes. And we're getting a little bit larger in body size now, but many nematodes are still microscopic and many also live in water films, although some live in, in soil pores too. Um, nematodes are unsegmented transparent worms and they have tapered ends. Um, they have specialized mouth parts for different food sources. Here in this really nice illustration on the left, this is a nematode that's a bacterial feeder. In the middle here, you've got a, a nematode with piercing silky mouth parts that feeds on fungi or on plant roots. And then on the right, you've got a nematode with teeth that's a predator and will hunt tardigrades or rotifers or other nematodes. Uh, nematodes are among the most numerous animals on the planet. So they're fairly ubiquitous um, wherever, everywhere, absolutely everywhere, water, soil, all habitats. Um, they're just incredibly numerous. And some species have separate sexes, so individuals that are male, individuals that are female. Some have um, a both sex organs present in the same individual. And um, just like these other groups that have lived in the, the, um, the water films and the soil, they're really dependent on that soil moisture. And so they enter the cryptobiosis when water films dry up. Um, they can survive harsh conditions as well. And um, the record for the longest lived organism that we know of so far that that's an animal anyway is um, 30,000 year old nematodes that were revitalized from glacial deposits. So this is another group that's incredibly tolerant. Um, this is also animals that go the deepest in soil. They have been found down as deep as 2.2 miles down in the soil. Um, this group, as I mentioned, there are some that feed on living plant tissue. So it includes some species that can cause economic damage to crops like corn and rice, some citrus and soybeans. Um, that's a small proportion overall of the, all the species of nematodes. Most species of nematodes have other um, food web roles. Uh, but there are also a few parasites of um, invertebrates that can help control different invertebrates in the soil, but also some that are damaging to vertebrates, including a few that are parasites of humans like hookworm and filarial worm. And um, the picture that you see here on the bottom is of a fungi that's captured nematodes. So nematodes are eaten by a lot of different things, but probably the most unusual thing to eat them are fungi that trap them. Um, this particular fungi has a constricting ring that it uses to hold the nematode and eventually digest the nematode. One last thing about nematodes, they are, um, good quality indicators, their presence correlates with um, nutrients in the soil and plant growth. And they can also be really sensitive to disturbances. So that's a way to, um, to measure the impacts of disturbances. But the only, um, this is a major downside is that there are limitations to who can ID uh, nematodes in the soil, free living nematodes. Okay, next up and increasing in size at this point because potworms are all visible to the naked eye, um, are potworms. And this is a, a group of small uh, segmented worms. They're mostly colorless, mostly white. Uh, they are tapered at both ends and um, they live in the upper soil labor. So unlike earthworms that can live in the upper, middle and deeper soil layer, you only find these really on the upper soil layer or in the leaf litter and compost. And that, that's where they feed on decaying organic matter, um, sometimes also bacteria and fungi. And um, 
This is the first group that we've talked about so far that really starts to influence soil structure. And this is a group that even though they're small in size, does have an impact on um, soil structure through their burrowing and mixing of minerals and matter. So they are uh, important ecosystem engineers. Probably much more familiar to everybody are earthworms. These are animals that have a tube-like segmented body. Um, earthworms have a clitellum. Um, in addition to being larger than potworms and more dark in color, they have a, a structure called a clitellum. It's a smooth band that wraps around the top of their body um, that houses their reproductive structures and it's closest to the head. So earthworms uh, burrow within the soil and they consume leaf litter and the soil itself as they go. And um, both their burrowing action and their processing of organic matter in the soil really um, contribute significantly to, to soil health. They can improve porosity in the soil, they increase water infiltration, they move nutrients around, um, they really actually just move a ton of soil around on a pretty large scale. So they are also ecosystem engineers. And um, one important thing to note about earthworms in the United States is that we have um, a pretty unusual distribution of native species um, the middle chunk of the United States has um, very few native indigenous species. There's a few on the, in the Northeast. Most of them are found in the South and then um, along some of the Pacific states. So California has its own unique native earthworm fauna, uh, but there are also quite a number of species that have been introduced, um, particularly from Europe and a few from Asia as well. So about one third of all the species that you can find are introduced. And that, inc that includes a lot of the most common things that you can see. So California's native earthworm fauna is found in um, habitats, all sorts of habitats that range from forests with lots of moisture all the way to semi-desert. But on croplands and orchards and in cities, that's where the introduced earthworms have really Thrived and has have displaced native species. So it's much less common to see native species in those types of habitats. They're pretty sensitive to soil disturbance, so they'll disappear from an area that has undergone tillage, for example. And um, these non-native earthworms can be beneficial in some settings and detrimental in others. Um, for example, some introduced species will deplete leaf litter really quickly and won't mix nutrients within soil layers very effectively. So that can remove habitat for species that use the leaf litter. It can also lead to nutrient loss within the soil. And so um, it's just worth considering that earthworms are not always the superstars of soil health in all settings and in all places. Um, so one kind of cool thing about earthworms before I move on is that they can regenerate some segments beyond the, the head, um, and each individual has both male and female organs, so um, they're able to reproduce with other individuals they encounter in the soil. And earthworms can be pretty long-lived, about four years. And then lastly, too, if you've ever used them as bait for fishing, they can survive underwater for significant periods of time. So, um, so you never want to assume that that earthworm is dead after you pull it out of the water. It's probably going to make it just fine. So um, not releasing worms that have been used for bait uh, is, is a good thing to think about. All right, so um, from here on out, we're actually moving into a further specialized group of invertebrates. We're moving into arthropods. Arthropods are invertebrates that have exoskeletons and that's a hardened um, cover outside of their body. So they have structure on the outside rather than bones on the inside of their body. And they have segments and arthropods also have jointed appendages to help them move. And the four main groups of arthropods include the hexapoda, which are the insects and springtails, 
the miripoda, the centipedes and millipedes, um, chilla serrata, mites and spiders, and then crustacea, which include um, terrestrial species, wood lice and crayfish, but the majority of crustaceans are found in aquatic habitats. So those are our arthropods. And um, because they have the skeleton on the outside of their body as they grow, they have to shed it in order to be able to grow. So they go through this process called metamorphosis. And um, some groups go through some very different transformations. So there are groups of arthropods that have incomplete metamorphosis, which means that they start out as young nymphs and look very similar to the adults, um, often just just look like a smaller version and they live in the same habitat and often eat the same food source and just grow in size each time they molt. This includes um, animals like spiders and mites, also grasshoppers and true bugs. Um, then there are also some arthropods that go through complete metamorphosis, which means they go through a transformation um, in stages that look very different from one another. So they start out as eggs and transform into larvae, which have a different food source than the adult and often live in a different habitat as well. So they have a little bit more complicated life cycles, and that includes groups like beetles, ants, flies, um, and more. So the first arthropod group that we're starting with today is one of the most abundant, and that's mites. These are little tiny pear-shaped um, animals, mostly they have dark bodies. They, the adults have eight legs. Um, they're visible with a naked eye, but they are, they are quite tiny. And it's among the most diverse and abundant group in soil. So no matter where you go, you can find mites. And there's two main groups of mites. The orbatid mites are super decomposers and they're really critical for um, breaking down organic material of all sorts into bits that bacteria will use. Um, as they're moving through the soil layers too, they're dispersing bacteria and fungi, and that's an important role as well. And then um, we've also got our second group, the mesostigmata mites, and those are predatory mites that feed on smaller life. So they influence soil animal communities like springtails and nematodes, and um, insect eggs and so forth. Mites have um, varying life cycles because it's such a diverse group. You can find different lifestyle strategies, like those that can reproduce really quickly in just a few weeks to those that are much more longer lived. Um, the, the immature instars, the nymphs, they have six legs. So uh, if you foresee a really teeny tiny mite, it could just be in that immature stage. And um, as mites are moving through the environment, they often take advantage of hanging on to larger animals just to move from place to place. Like here's a whole group of mites that are grabbing on to this darkling beetle to get a ride to a new location. So often they have that, um, that uh, a role that's really um, beneficial for them and not harmful to the critter that they're hanging on to. Mite fauna is pretty unique with soil types. So if you've got a specialist soil that you're working with, it has a really unique um, plant community and really unique mite community associated with it. And they can also be pretty sensitive to soil disturbance. All right. Our next group are springtails, uh, known as columbula as well. And springtails, their common name comes from the way, the way that they propel themselves around. Um, they have a structure called a fricula, pictured here with this orange arrow. It's just a structure that's under tension that they use, and it flings them into the air to spin or turn and, or just to jump. And um, this is important when they're just trying to escape predation, for example. Um, those that are really active above the surface or on the leaf litter or in the upper layer of surface are, are much more mobile. And then you do have some columba that, that can live in deep soil, and those often have a reduced spring, and they've also lost their eyesight too. 
um, because they, they live so deep, they just never, they never need to see. Uh, springtails contribute to decomposition by fragmenting plants and fungi, but some also are predatory and can influence microbial communities by what they eat. And um, next up, I'm going to show you this video. Um, hopefully, I can get us a play of um, springtails in action. And this was taken by a professor at North Carolina State who um, took this last year at the height of the pandemic. You're about to watch this globular springtail jump and spin faster than any other animal on Earth. Ready? Right, so I'm going to stop it there, but I put the links to that video in the chat so you can watch the whole thing and hear how amazing it is that springtails can fly through the air so quickly <laughs> and rotate so quickly. Uh, it's a pretty fascinating tale, but hopefully that gives you a sense of how they move and you know they don't have a ton of control about where they end up, but their main goal is just to get away from where they are, <laughs> so it works pretty well. Next up, and kind of moving in a different direction, are wood lice. These are crustaceans, and this is the, the only group that we're talking about today, the only group of crustaceans. I mentioned earlier that most crustaceans are aquatic, um, but wood lice are terrestrial. However, they still retain the need for moisture in order to breathe properly. So they're only found in moist places, moist habitats, moist environments. Um, you won't, you won't find them in, in um, very arid places. Um, pill bugs are, there's two main groups of wood lice, pill bugs and sow bugs. And of course I'm, pill bugs are more familiar to me as roller polies. They have this ability to roll up into a ball to protect themselves. Um, sow bugs look very similar to roller polies, but they do have two appendages on their back end and they don't, they don't roll. All of these uh, different types of wood lice are um, decomposers. They'll break down um, decaying material, but they also will feed on fresh debris, especially plant debris, and can have very specific preferences for the type of plant species that they feed on. So for example, they might prefer holly leaves over oak leaves. And they also have specialized bacteria in their gut to help them break down fresh plant material because that can be kind of hard to break down for many different animals. Uh, this group has um, some native species, but most of them occur in caves or littoral areas, places where there's lots of moisture. Um, and in other parts of the United States, that's really dominated by introduced species, mostly from Europe. So about one third of all the species of wood lice are introduced. And of course, some of the common species, like all pill bugs that you find have been our European species. Um, wood lice uh, live about two years and they actually survive the young new by feeding on secretions for the mother. So there's lots of investment in their young. And um, interestingly, with regards to soil health, they can tolerate heavy metals and accumulate those toxins in their body. So they can be used to monitor the accumulation of contaminants within soil, soils that are um, heavily contaminated. Now we're gonna talk about some much larger arthropods. For a few minutes. Um, millipedes are significantly larger than a lot of the groups that we've been talking about. Um, they have elongated bodies. They're segmented, of course, but there's two pairs of legs per, for each um, segment. So it looks like they have many, many legs, which is, of course, where their name millipedes comes from. They have just one pair of antennae and they have chewing mouth parts. So they aren't um, a threat to biting people, they aren't really interested in biting anything other than um, plants. They're decomposers and incredibly important decomposers. They're responsible for fragmenting about 15% of leaf fall 
in um, autumn. So that's really important for facilitating microbial decomposition further. Um, they are also powerful diggers, so they can excavate pretty deep soil tunnels and are long lived. So um, they can live up to 11 years, quite long for arthropods. So similar to millipedes, centipedes have segmented bodies um, and they're very elongated, but um, unlike millipedes, they're a little bit more flat and they, often, they only have one pair of legs per segment. Also centipedes are predatory, they hunt. And so they have um, the first pair of legs that's modified to um, into pincers and they use those to inject um, venom into their prey, to, um, to freeze their prey and then to break down their prey for eating. They're very fast runners. They're really active um, around dusk or at night. Um, and they'll eat large, small life in the soil as well as large life as well. So this includes larger animals like earthworms, um, but even reptiles or amphibians or small mammals. So they really aren't afraid to hunt larger animals. And some will bite people if you handle them. Another group of important predators are spiders. And spiders are um, easy to recognize. They've got eight legs and two body regions. Uh, they have multiple eyes and um, they are predatory and both the immature phase, the nymph phase, as well as the adult. Um, it's really those that hunt on the soil surface that we see the most. So you might have seen jumping spiders that have two really large eyes in the center and um, often have, they're just really curious and, and will spend some time looking at you. Um, you might be, be familiar with wolf spiders that have um, these stripes that run along the sides of their body, or ground spiders. These all hunt actively on, on the ground um, or in leaf litter on top. Uh, but there are also other groups that will dig small tunnels or burrows, and then they'll create a, a web within that space to hunt and wait. For, predator, for prey to come. So they'll just wait in their web, their web will capture them and then they'll take the prey from there. So um, those are less visible, but you can often see their webs and, and know they're there. Um, spiders are pretty long lived. They, um, they reproduce in sacs. Their eggs are within these silken sacs. Usually those sacs make it through the winter or sometimes the adult makes it through the winter and then lays eggs in the spring before dying. Um, but the eggs will um, emerge usually in the beginning of springtime and the adults live anywhere from one year to three years. So they do reproduce slowly. And that means that disturbances can impact their populations quite a while. Um, so they can take quite a while to recover from like uh, soil disturbance from pesticides or tillage. Um, spiders can play a role above ground in conservation biological control um, by contributing to the control of crop pests. But that's the, the, their ability to contribute to conservation biological control is tied to permanent plantings that are nearby agricultural fields um, because they can't survive in um, the cropped land itself because of the disturbance. So, Having that habitat nearby allows them a place to overwinter, um, and then they can move into the crop later that year. Uh, here in the picture at the bottom, you can see a wolf spider, and she's carrying a ton of little tiny babies on her back. So spiders do provide some forms of maternal care to get their young up and going. Okay, we're gonna pause here real quick, and I wanted to ask and hear from you about how you have thought about soil invertebrates in your work before today. So if you could tell us a little bit about that in the chat, have you thought about them? Maybe this is your first time thinking about them or maybe you're, you're really familiar with a particular group um, or you wanted to learn more. We're just curious to know about how, how they've 
in, integrated into your work before today. So add that in the chat um, and I'll just take a look. Jennifer, um, this is Stephanie. And while we're kind of paused here also, I just wanted to highlight that um, in the chat earlier when you were talking about earthworms, Mm -hmm. um, there was a question about invasive earthworms. So I don't know if you want to um, talk about those at now or at some point here, but there was a question yeah. about that. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that right here. Um, so there are, there's a, <laughs> there's a group of earthworms called the jumping worms that hail from different parts of Asia and have there's probably about 15 species or so that can be found in the United States. And right now, um, they are most common in the Eastern states moving into the Great Plains. So they can be found from Maine down to Florida and as far west as where I am located in Nebraska. However, a few have also been found in Oregon. And it's definitely a... Um, a concern for California, keeping an eye out for some of these jumping worms, and for sure in other states in the West, um, as they're sort of moving around the United States. Um, these particular jumping worms are problematic because there's no way to eradicate once you get them in the area. So the best way um, to slow them is just to prevent their movement. <laughs> um, but they are particularly bad at consuming leaf litter and leaving behind soil casts that are very nutrient poor. So they're not good at mixing nutrients into the soil so they can deplete the soil of nutrients and they can increase erosion. They also can spread invasive plant species. There's just a lot of layers to their, to their the problems that they cause. Um, so we're still learning a lot about them, but. Yeah, right now, I don't believe that they've been recorded in California, but there's that's one example of a group that is highly invasive and highly problematic that um, may be the wave of the future. Um, there are also another a number of other common species that um, I alluded to their you know, more common in disturbed habitats and can provide some benefits in those, but can be detrimental as well um, by pushing out native species that actually do a better job of integrating nutrients. So there's different levels of invasiveness, I suppose, um, in earthworms, but the biggest group that is of most ecological concern and economic concern are those jumping worms. So I'm just gonna take a quick look at the chat box. It looks like there's some really good notes in here, thinking about um, home gardener scale for or organics and soil ecology. Um, and then thinking about um, just the impacts of the, on these organisms from removing plants and soil disturbance and some folks are um, familiar with some of these groups that we've talked about. And um, for our management group, thinking about re regenerative agriculture and thinking about um, how to improve soil health and how to nail down soil biodiversity <laughs> and how to measure this practically. So that's a really good question. I think that um, Stephanie's gonna circle back to that in the, the next module after the break. So we should, um, we should stay tuned for that. Um, some folks interested in taxonomy and biodiversity, that's super, that's a really important thing and important niche to fill. Um, yes, and the invasive earthworms are coming from Asia. Um, and I think I mentioned some other activities are just very similar to other earthworms, they burrow, um, but this particular group removes a lot of leaf litter from the surface and doesn't, um, doesn't reincorporate nutrients into the soil layer. So a lot of the soil loses nutrients by the presence of these earthworms and they remove habitat for other beneficial insects that rely on that leaf litter. 
So they have sort of cascading effects on ecosystems. All right, well, thank you so much for your good questions and the, the good chat, I appreciate that. It's really nice to hear, hear about you know, where you all are coming from and what experiences you've had. Um, I'm gonna move ahead into some other groups. From here on out, we're talking about insects only. And insects are animals with three body regions. They have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Um, they have three pairs of legs. They only have one pair of antenna. That's opposed to some of these other groups that have two. Um, and many have wings. And a lot of these different features somehow have combined into this magical package that's allowed insects to completely dominate the diversity of life on our planet. <laughs> Overall, half of all the known species are insects, so they are incredibly successful and um, really live every single place that humans live and then a ton of places where we cannot live. So um, they're really amazing animals. And there's many, many, many different groups of insects that live in the soil. Um, or have a portion of their life cycle in the soil. Over 80% of all the soil animals are insects. So as I mentioned, there's just a huge diversity. And in the soil life guide that you got as a packet of resources, um, there's a lot of different profiles to cover a lot of these different groups of soil insects. Um, but today I'm just gonna focus on a, a few really key groups. So um, if you want to learn more about some of these other groups pictured here, check out that resource. And I'm just gonna dive into some of the special value groups um, on farms in particular. Um, first up, I'm gonna talk about flies that are decomposers. Um, it's the larval stage, the immature stage that contributes to plant decomposition. And they can be really important decomposers of plant material. Um, so the larval stages of crane flies, of, of dance flies, non-biting midges, long-legged flies, moth flies, march flies, um, and then snipe flies all contribute to plant decomposition uh, as larvae. As adults, some of these adults are not feeding, so they don't feed during their life, um, while some uh, drink nectar from flowers and so can be seen on, on flowers. Another important group of flies are flower flies. These are a little bit more visible than some of those groups I just talked about because the adults are really common on flowers and they have this coloration that mimics bees or wasps. Um, they drink nectar or sometimes eat pollen. And in fact, they are really important um, pollinators of many different flowers, but also of crops. So second to bees, flower flies are, are some of the most efficient pollinators. It's their larval stage though, that have that really important tie to soil. Their larva can be decomposers of plant matter in soil, or they can be predatory in soil. And then some also are predatory and active on hunting on plants. So here at the bottom picture, this is the legless green gray larva. Um, and they can feel around and have pretty good senses. They find their prey and then they'll pounce. Um, so even though they're small in size, they really have big impacts. So this is the, the larva you see and it's got an aphid in its jaws. So um, they can be important in contributing to the control of crop pests and conservation biological control. And um, because they overwinter in the soil and feed in the soil or leaf litter, um, that connection to the soil is really key to their survival. But the other component is uh, because the adults eat nectar, they also need flower and plant habitat to survive. So um, to have this group, which is of particular value on farms present, you need to have that balance of good soil practices and um, non-crop habitat as well. This is another group that can contribute to crop pest control, soldier beetles. Um, the adults are found on flowers, drinking nectar, sometimes eating pollen. The larvae are hunters and they hunt in the soil layers, the upper soil layer or the leaf litter or on plants. And they eat prey like insect eggs, like what you see in this picture here. Um, they also feed on aphids, but they also will eat on much larger um, animals, including 
slugs and snails. Um, the, the adults have leathery wing covers and superficially they represent, they um, resemble, excuse me, the next group, which are fireflies, which also have a similar body shape and these leathery wing covers. This is a key time for fireflies, um, but not common in the West. They have these luminous segments and um, attract males, uh, mates by flashing patterns. And the larvae have luminous segments also, and they are hunters in the soil and they seek out earthworms and slail, snails and slugs and larger, larger critters and overwinter in the soil. Our next group of beetles are tiger beetles. And these are animals that are common in um, well-drained soil, in particular sandy soils. Um, tiger beetle adults actively hunt on the surface. They are really good hunters. They have excellent eyesight. They've got those prominent eyes that you can see in this picture here. And they're very fast runners. In fact, the fastest known insect is a tiger beetle. Um, and they'll feed on a, whatever type of arthropod that they come across in the encounter. Uh, the larva, in contrast, have a really close um, closely tied relationship in the soil. They dig burrows, which can be um, 10 to 45 inches in deep. They attach themselves to the side of the burrow. They've got a flattened head, so they'll sit and wait in that burrow, and their head will, will uh, make them look a lot more innocent than they are. While they wait for a critter to come by, and then they'll They'll snatch it with their really huge jaws and bring it back down into the depths of their burrow where they consume it. And um, the larva in this stage can be long lived for two to three years, feeding in the soil in this manner before they um, transform into adults. Ground beetles are closely related to tiger beetles. They have those prominent eyes. Um, they do have ridged wing covers and they're much more drab in coloration. Um, the larvae though have the same sickle-like jaws and are predatory um, as well as the adults. So the larvae are most active on the soil uh, and the upper soil layer and in leaf litter. Um, they're predatory and important in controlling slugs and snails, grasshoppers, beetles, and more. So this is an important group for biological control. Um, what's really interesting about ground beetles, though, is they don't just feed on, on other arthropods or other animals. They will also feed on decaying plant material. And some also consume weed seeds. So this is a highly beneficial group to have on farms. And um, they lay their eggs in the soil and overwinter in bunch grass clumps or well-drained soil. So oftentimes they do need habitat that's um, outside of the crop field in order to overwinter successfully or to survive successfully. And pictured here, this is a, a beetle bank from Oregon. Um, a beetle bank is a strip of um, an earthen ridge, so a bermed area that's been planted with bunch grasses. So that area provides a place for beetles to shelter and overwinter. And these beetle banks are usually planted within an agricultural field to help facilitate the movement of ground beetles from the beetle bank into the field in the spring and then moving, move back in the fall to overwinter. So uh, it's, an, it's a neat type of habitat, a unique type of habitat installation to facilitate a particular group. Um, they're really sensitive to tillage, and that's why, and they have a longer life cycle. So um, disturbance like insecticides or tillage can have um, long-lived impacts on their populations, and that's why including habitat nearby is such a critical component of um, maintaining them on, on working lands. Rove beetles have very similar <laughs> Um, lifestyles as to ground beetles and can respond to similar conservation measures. So you can find them in beetle banks as well. Um, they 
eat some of the same foods, insect eggs, slugs, mites, um, but they are more involved in decomposition as well. You can find them on animal carcasses as well as eating um, decaying plant material. They also can exist in deeper soil. So um, those that live in deeper soil have reduced wing covers, much smaller than the small wing covers that most rove beetles already have. Um, next up are burying beetles. Um, these are beetles with really colorful patterns and they feed on animal carcasses, breaking down dead animal bodies. They're really good at finding these, can detect that scent and um, have different types of preferences for different animal bodies. So um, the burying beetle pictured here with the red and black coloration, um, prefers smaller birds or small mammals, whereas carrying beetles are happy with pretty big carcasses. They lay their eggs directly on it um, while it breaks down, whereas burying beetles carefully prepare the smaller carcass and actually bury it and then feed it to their young carefully. Their decomposition of carrion is really important because carrion is nutrient rich and because they, um, their action directly relates to soil fertility significantly and can influence plant communities. So I mentioned that burying beetles will prepare their carcass. They'll bury, they'll dig a hole underneath their little small mammal or bird, and then they'll remove the hair or feathers and process it. And then they'll feed it to their young by regurgitating it. So they put, they put a lot of parental investment into feeding their young and both the male and female parent are involved in that process, which is pretty unusual. Um, carrying beetles, on the other hand, are not so helpless as larvae. They will, um, they feed themselves. Their parents usually have moved on to a different place. Well, they're on their own to eat the carrion, but they also will eat fly larvae or other beetles that might be competitors. And so that's an important role in that they can, their presence can help to cut down on, on, um, on certain types of flies. And um, both of these groups have different lifestyles. So some have just one generation a year and reproduce more slowly. Um, when it comes to burying beetles, there are, um, there is one species that's listed under the Endangered Species Act currently um, that, you, that can only be found in six states currently. All right, moving on to dung beetles. These are beetles with an oval body, clubbed antenna, and they have these scalloped legs, which they use for digging. Um, this is a group that feeds exclusively on dung and often prefer the dung of um, herbivorous mammals in particular. They're really good at detecting it. Um, they can find it from 30 miles away. So from our, um, just really amazing little animals. Um, and their decomposition role is so critical because it can influence the palatability of forage, but it also reduces the, the presence of parasitic flies, um, li flies that are harmful to livestock like screwworm or hornworm. And uh, because by removing the habitat where those flies reproduce, um, reduces their ability to reproduce. Um, they can also disrupt the, the flies that feed on dung and their ability to carry and spread E. coli through um, farms as well. So it can reduce the spread of foodborne pathogens on farms. So these are just hugely important roles. There's a couple different strategies for securing dung which is a pretty hot commodity. Dung beetles can lay it directly in a pat and then reproduce really quickly. Um, they all might dig a tunnel beneath the pat and then move chunks of dung into the tunnel or they'll roll a portion of the dung away from the pat before digging a tunnel and a nest underneath. Um, dung beetles can be pretty long lived, but they can be impacted by the parasites uh, or the treatments for parasites for cattle. So you've got a poron treatment like ivermectin that can um, make its way into the dung and then can harm dung beetles that are consuming that. And that can actually slow down dung decomposition significantly. 
Um, I'm going to show you a video really quickly about some rollers, uh, dung beetle rollers. They work in pairs, the male and the female, to roll the ball and then take it back to their nest and feed it. So sometimes dung beetles will steal balls away from other dung this beetles. Is in the middle of the road. I hope they make it. And um, they also use a lot of different environmental cues to help them get that ball away as fast as possible <laughs> from competitors. And that includes using, during the daytime, they use polarized light. Um, and at nighttime, they use the moon. And if the moon is not available, they'll use the Milky Way. So lots of different interesting strategies. And again, we're really learning so much more about how amazing insects are um, all the time. Coming into the home stretch for these different profiles, um, ants are related to bees and wasps, and they have a constricted waist and elbowed antennae. They live below ground in nests that can be very, very extensive underground. Um, they are important ecosystem engineers because of these nests that they built. Their excavation and mixing of soil makes them hugely significant. They integrate nutrients, they aerate the soil. Um, they're also predators or can contribute to plant decomposition and animal decomposition. So they just play many multiple roles in soil health. Um, they live in such large colonies because they're truly a social. So all different ants that exist within a, a colony. Um, and individuals within the colony have a very specific role. Here's a mated queen that initiates the nest and produces brood. Her workers, her daughters, provide guarding or foraging um, or nursing care or cleaning or um, many other roles within the colony. And they're all working collectively for the betterment of the colony. So you can see from this picture here that their nest can be really intricate and extensive underground. Um, this scientist pictured here is Walter Chinkle and he calls them nature's grand architects. And these plaster casts have revealed that some colonies can be as deep as 12 feet. Um, ant nests include a lot of other soil critters that live in there as well as, as symbionts. So they're mutually beneficial like rove beetles and a couple other small beetles or cockroaches or mites live within ant nests and help to further break down ant waste. So there's lots of cool relationships below ground. With um, one important thing to mention is that this is yet another group that does have a lot of introduced species in the United States and in California. Um, imported fire ants are a, a particular problem. Um, and then Argentine ants are, can also be pests on farms or sometimes in cities in California or a couple other states of the West. <clears throat> um, related to ants are ground nesting bees. And bees are often much, much more hairy, have um, different colorations, and the females have pollen carrying structures. In, about 70, 80% of all the species of bees found in the US actually nest in the ground. And, you know, bees are so well known for their role as pollinators because female bees will provision their nests with pollen and nectar when they're young. And that means that they spend a lot of time visiting flowers and moving pollen between flowers. So they're really critical pollinators and they're well known for that. Um, but they actually also move a lot of soil in the process of constructing their nests. Um, and their nests can be fairly shallow, just a couple centimeters, or fairly deep, a foot to a meter, or even more, depending on the soil type. They can move, they can build these nests in, in ag fields as well. Here's pictured here is a sunflower field in California um, with some bees that actively visit some and pollinate sunflowers. Um, because they do nest in agricultural fields, they can be harmed by tillage, um, especially those uh, deep, deeper tillage and those that, that nest in the shallow layers. Um, pictured here is a bee that has adapted to um, nesting in pretty uh, compacted soil. And um, what you see here is she's digging 
and flinging little balls of mud out. She's actually moistened the soil by bringing water back to the nest of her crop and then moistening it. So it's easier for her to dig deeper. And that's why it looks like she has little balls of mud that she's kicking out um, to build her nest. Most um, ground nesting bees are solitary. So unlike ants, individuals are working on their own to build their nest and, and then provision their nest and provide for their young. So these bees don't pose a health risk to, to people in that they aren't going to defend their nest. They're not gonna sting people to defend their nest because they lose the chance to reproduce um, in doing so. Here you can see um, a tunnel that leads to different branches and chambers. And then within each of these chambers, that's where um, the female bee would provide food for each individual. That's a ball of pollen and nectar you see there, and then a little bee larva on top. And you can also see the difference within that chamber. The wall is really smooth and shiny. There are a number of ground nesting bees that secrete a substance that um, provides sort of this protection for, for water, soil moisture to seal in their developing bee to protect it. So some species can actually survive periodic flooding um, just because of that, that substance. Um, here also pictured are uh, squash bees. There are a number of, of bee species that specialize on pollen from particular plants. And uh, squash bees are, are one of them. They only collect pollen from plants in the genus Cucurbita and are really important, in fact, to pumpkin pollination, gourd, squash, zucchini, and so forth. Um, related to bees and ants are ground nesting predatory wasps. And just very similar to bees, they build these solitary nests in the ground. So they are not, not um, a risk to stinging unless you somehow pick them up and squeeze them or so forth. But um, they, they don't want to defend their nests. They're also good diggers. It's the females are found on flowers sipping nectar, but they also hunt prey and they can be important in biological control because of this. They'll eat caterpillars and grasshoppers and crickets and stink bugs and can be pretty effective hunters for a lot of different crop pests. Scarab hunting wasps <laughs> are a subset group and these feed specifically um, um, scarab beetles that are found in grassy areas, particularly lawns. So they will dig down and when they've detected a scarab beetle larva, they'll dig down and lay their egg on it in the soil and then go back up to the surface and, and search for more. Um, and then their developing larva will feed on that scarab beetle. So, that covers a, a wide range of diversity, but one, one a couple different groups I haven't talked about yet are those that eat living plant material. Um, these include things like scarab beetle grubs, which I just mentioned. So that could include um, things like Japanese beetles, um, wireworms, which are click beetle larvae, soil dwelling caterpillars, which are the larval stage of, of a couple different groups of moths. Some of these species, can be crop or ornamental pests and can cause economic damage. Uh, but in a balanced system, you've got all sorts of different predators, like many of the ones I just mentioned, ground beetles, rose beetles, soldier beetles, flower flies, and more um, that can help control these different pests. That's true too for um, other groups like snails and slugs, which have a component of their diversity, about 20% that will feed on live tissue and can be crop pests. Um, like pictured here is the slug feeding on the soybean um, seedling. These two can be controlled by rove beetles and fireflies and um, in other soil life. So what these animals are doing below ground really has a huge influence on our life above ground. They are breaking down plant and animal material, they're transforming complex chemicals, they're altering soil structure, and all of these things, all this work really enhances plant productivity, which hugely benefits us when we're trying to grow food and, and 
and, um, create shelter and fuel. They also contribute to climate regulation um, because their work incorporating organic matter stores more carbon. They contribute to biological control, pollination, and then they're also just food for wildlife. So um, hopefully we've given you a pretty a good snapshot of all this really interesting, amazing life that happens out of sight. And um, with that today, I'm actually going to stop here. And if you've got questions, feel free to add them into the Q&A or save them till the end. And then we're going to take a break from here until 11 a.m. when we'll return. And thank you. Thanks so much.